Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about exercise and physical therapy for people with Parkinson's disease. And I, I'm wondering if you can raise your hand. How many people are currently see a physical therapist for their movement disorder? Do, raise your hand. Okay, only a couple people. And how many of you people currently exercise in the audience? Oh, a lot of people, good, okay. Okay, and, and do you, when you exercise, do you do stretching? Okay, uh, strengthening with weights, a couple of people. Uh, cardio, vascular, walking, bicycle, okay. And then, and then balance, how many people work on their balance? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you today about specifically what aspects of movement with Parkinson's disease are limiting mobility and what aspects can be helped then with movement and exercise. And some of these words you may be familiar with from your neurologist. So things like rigidity, that's a stiffness in your body. Bradykinesia, that's smaller and smaller movements and slowed, walk, slowed walking. Freezing of gait. Uh, poor sequential coordination, so sometimes it's difficult to do some complex movement, rolling over in bed, getting up from a chair, turning is difficult. Uh, sensory integration, and this is a sense of understanding where your body is in space. And we call it executive function, so this is a type of thinking, this is a type of high level thinking and decision making that sometimes can be impaired in Parkinson's disease. So. Most of us, it sounded like from the show of hands, uh, understand that it's, it's a good thing to exercise. So even if you don't have Parkinson's, exercise is very important. But it, one, of the, one of the reasons it's especially important for Parkinson's disease uh, to exercise is because of falls. So we, we use balance and exercise to prevent falls as your disease progresses. Um, falls are very, very common in Parkinson's disease. And up to half of the people that was followed in a study fell during a three-month period. Um, and people who don't currently fall, as the disease progresses, can convert to, to falling. So something that we work on really hard in exercise and physical therapy is preventing falls. Another reason that we, we talk about exercise for Parkinson's is that a lot of times medications, while they help a lot of things, they often don't help people's balance and walking. And that's true for deep brain stimulation as well. So some people that we see actually experience worse balance after they have their medications or deep brain stimulation. So exercise is becoming a hopeful way to work on balance and gait and to prevent falls, balance and walking so that you can prevent falls. There's other reasons to exercise that we call secondary. So these are to prevent other problems, so to prevent cardiovascular problems, depression, back pain, and there's some evidence that exercise also can slow the disease progression, and this is with the animal studies, and they're exercising at a high intensity level. There's also some emerging evidence that exercise can improve cognition, and we've heard from the other speakers, some of these non-motor signs of Parkinson's disease can be helped with exercise. This is, this is showing the different, the motor symptoms, as we heard from the other speakers, is the most obvious thing that we see in Parkinson's. And it's what we most obviously think exercise can help with. So these are things like balance, walking, and falls. There's also these other problems, depression, apathy, um, cognition, constipation, sleep, and fatigue, that we think, that we know from studies exercise can help as well. On the other side, the sedentary, a sedentary lifestyle, so this is um, a lifestyle where you're not moving, you're not exercising, not challenging yourself, can make all of these things worse, both the motor and the non-motor. So we think of these together. There's a lot of new studies coming out on exercise as well. So this, this graph shows, this is how many publications, if you, if you go to your computer and you look up publications over the year, so starting in 1970 all the way up to 1910, you can see the studies on medication, so 
with when levodopa came into the picture. Lots and lots of people started studying the effects of levodopa. Then later, a little bit later, uh, we started looking at deep brain stimulation, a steep rise in how many people were studying and, and conducting studies. And here's exercise. So it's lagging behind the other ones, but you can see just in the last decade or two how, how many people are researching exercise. And the reason for that is that, as I said, there's it's helping with some of the problems that medications and deep brain stimulation may not help with. So when we, when we think about how, how can exercise, how would it help someone with Parkinson's, we think about three different ways it can help. So prevention, compensation, and that means doing things a different way, using a different part of your brain to achieve the same action, and neuroprotection. And that's, in other words, trying to preserve the neurons that are still viable and healthy that we have in our brains. When we think about prevention, primarily we're talking about avoiding falls and fractures. So there's lots and lots of studies now to show that exercise and physical therapy and balance training can, can prevent and help you um, delay the onset of falling. Avoiding cardiovascular heart and heart attacks and strokes, depression, back pain, and loneliness that can accompany um, a very sedentary lifestyle. Compensation is another way that physical therapy or exercise may help you. So when you go to your physical therapist with a problem, they'll come up with another way for you to achieve the same task. And they'll use these different strategies. So we use external cues a lot to make steps bigger, make movements bigger, uh, make your voice louder. Um, breaking down the task into simpler components and uh, being able to do things without watching what your legs are doing. So trying to have your brain and your, and your um, arms and legs working t together. And we've, we find that you actually, when you do things differently like this, you're using a different part of your brain. So you can sort of learn to circumvent the area that uh, has difficulty with Parkinson's disease. So this is, a, this is a video where I'll show you how compensating with visual cues can really help a person move better. And so I'll show you. This person is with Parkinson's. She's asked to just walk across the room. Okay, so you, whoops, okay. Let me try that again. Okay. So that may look very familiar to some of you. She's having a lot of difficulty. She's having freezing of gait. She's having a hard time getting her steps big enough to achieve her goal, which is to walk across the room. So what the physical therapist did then, she, she put lines on the floor. And so you can see how much that helps her. So we have a lot of patients who, if they're experiencing freezing in their homes, and often it's, often people have more freezing in a tight quarters, maybe the bathroom, the kitchen. So our patients will put lines on the floor to help cue them to get bigger steps and to um, have less freezing. Uh, this is a gentleman whose primary um, difficulty was in getting at rolling over in bed. And that's a very common uh, reason that we see people in physical therapy. And so this is, he, he said it took him when he was off his medications, sometimes up to a whole minute just to turn over in bed. And so the physical therapist then worked with him to use a different strategy to achieve a faster outcome. So you can see that's, and that also may look familiar um, to people because it's a very common difficulty. And so then he, he worked on this. And you can see he's, he's using a different strategy to achieve the same thing. Okay. So physical therapy is really for all stages of the disease. And in, in the United States, um, the trend historically has been we don't see people until they're already having a lot of difficulties. So they might come to the physical therapist because they're falling um, or they're having trouble getting out of the car, out of the bed, um, off the floor, 
or they may come because they're unable to do the same amount of activity and they're afraid of falling. And so the physical therapist then will assess their walking and their balance. But the trend now in the United States is to try to see people before you have balance problems. So when someone first gets diagnosed with Parkinson's, that's the time to start working on exercise at a high enough intensity because people are still able to work hard in their exercise program. So now our our model in the United States is to see people right away when they get diagnosed, even though you don't have any walking problems potentially in the beginning. That's what we were trying to um, have that message get to the patients. And then we ask people to come back every a couple times a year because things change. Um, so Parkinson's it is a progressive disease. Um, so it's important to check back in with someone, a, a professional who can monitor what you're doing with in your activity level. And then the last way that exercise can help, and this is potentially the big rise in, um, in the animal studies showing that there's neuroprotection that can occur, particularly in the early stages when you still have the neurons that are producing the dopamine. So there's, there's, there's evidence that these neurons can be protected with a growth factor that's, that is healthy for the neurons. And so exercise, can, it's called BDNF. And so exercise, we know, increases the levels of BDNF in, in the person's brain. Um, but again, it's, it's really important to start early if you want to maximize the neuroprotection. So we have a lot of people that ask us, what's the best type of exercise? So patients, you don't know exactly know what you should be doing. And it's important because not all exercise is the same. So this is a video of the, our, our Parkinson's Disease Foundation gives people videos that they can take home and they can exercise on their own. Um, but in order to be safe, it's very uh, low level. It's not, not very intense. So this is what Here we, we have them do. And fan. Rotate, spread. So open, she has a group of return, patients. Six, and it's all seated because seven, they were afraid that someone would eight, fall. Fan, and rotate, so this is, they're working on spread. breathing and Give extension the of their spine. In the back. So a lot of people, if they're doing this a couple times a week, which is good, um, but it's not going to help their balance. Um, then we have, this is another example of, this is a person who, um, his name's Andy Grove. And if any of you may have heard of him, he's a, he was one of the founders of Intel. Um, very dynamic person. And he had Parkinson's. And he came to our lab in Oregon and asked us to help come up with a better way to exercise because he was doing these, this kind of thing. And he just he felt like he wasn't getting better. and he, he wanted more. And so he, he funded a lot of the early work we did on exercise. And so he sent us this video after we, we visited with him. This is how he exercises. So he has his own personal trainer that comes to his house every single day. They would do these crazy exercises. And, um, and he did really well over time. So one of the things about, one of the newer things when we talk about exercise is to try to do exercise with lots of thinking, lots of using your brain in, in a thinking way. Because what we find is that similar parts of the brain are responsible for walking and thinking. And so what we're trying to do now is look at, we call it cognition. So we're trying to incorporate that into our exercise. So you're not just doing one thing on a treadmill. Um, we try to bring in complex activities. So the reason being is we, there's a lot of evidence now that your, your cognition, so how you're thinking, how you're, how you're remembering, how you're planning, those track together with your mobility. And that's true for whether you have Parkinson's disease or not. So as someone's cognition starts to decline with aging, their mobility also declines, so they, they start walking slower. And so cogn people with cognitively, cognitive impairment, they fall more often than people without cognitive problems. And Parkinson's patients that have worse cognitive problems are also falling much more often than someone without. So they really are connected. And when they're tr historically treated very separately. So you might go to someone for your thinking, to help you with thinking, and then you go to someone for your balance. And we're really trying to bring um, teams together to work on that, um, to try to incorporate that more successfully for people. So one of the things that's specifically very difficult 
if you have Parkinson's disease, is we call it dual tasking. So that's doing two things at one time. And if you've ever walked with a very elderly person, sometimes it's so hard that they actually, if you ask them a question, they actually have to stop walking. And that's a very big predictor of falls, if you have to stop walking when someone asks you a question. Um, so we call that dual tasking. And, and this is, this is more difficult for people with Parkinson's disease because of the area of the brain that's impaired in Parkinson's disease. So people have trouble switching between two tasks. And you may have experienced this um, when you're trying to do something fairly complicated. The problem is you have to decide whether you're going to prioritize your balance or the skill that they're asking, someone's asking you to do. And that doesn't always occur um, properly. Sometimes people focus on the cognitive test instead of their balance. So um, this is a graph of people. Um, this is a group of patients, very early Parkinson's. They're not even on medications yet. And so we, we followed them for a year, and, and we followed how fast they were walking. And so this is, you can, and these are, we call them control subjects. They don't have Parkinson's. So they're already walking slower than someone without Parkinson's. But when you add a dual task, so we had them walking and, and subtracting by threes out loud. And you can see how much slower this made them. And, um, and it didn't change over the year. It got a little bit worse over the year. Whereas the people without Parkinson's um, had a little bit of trouble in the beginning, but then they, were, they did OK after they, they practiced many times. But so the good thing about this problem is that it can change with practice. So now there's several studies looking at can you train this? Can you help it if you practice and practice? And this is why we're trying to incorporate this into exercise. So th these are how fast someone's walking before they do the training. And then they do this training for a couple months in physical therapy. And then they get tested again. And then they retain those, those improvements. So if it's something that you have trouble with um, in your daily life, and it can be things like you notice it's just more difficult to be doing two things at once. Um, it's important to talk to the, if you see a physical therapist, they can help um, create a program to work on this and get better in that. And so the next thing people now are doing are thinking of exercises that naturally involve your memory and your um, executive function t skills. And so these are just some examples. So uh, we, there's a lot of people interested in dance in the United States. So they do um, tango dancing and waltz and, and different dances. And there's, there's good evidence that this is um, improving people with Parkinson's balance. Um, and Tai Chi, I know, is very um, popular here. I've seen many people on the streets and at the park. And there's really, really strong evidence that that's very helpful. So if you're, for you here in Hong Kong, um, that's, that's really a good positive thing because it's so easy to get involved in that. It's not so easy in the United States. It's becoming more popular um, for Parkinson's disease. And then uh, Margaret Mack, who's um, here in Hong Kong, is leading some studies where they, they do their training outside. And so it naturally incorporates challenges, um, dual task, uneven surfaces, steps, all the things you have to encounter in, in your life. So these are just some of the data that's showing that um, follow, following a person, a group of people with Parkinson's over a year, this is their balance on, on the scale. So they, they, this group just did nothing. They just d went about their life. And they, their balance declined over that year. This group did the exercise. They did tango dancing. And they improved within the first three months and maintained that. And it also helped with some of the non-motor symptoms. People reported better quality of life, um, more socializing. And, and now it's the same thing for Tai Chi. Um, there have been several studies on uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, published one comparing Tai Chi to more traditional things like stretching and strengthening your muscles and found a much higher benefit in the group that did Tai Chi. And again, helpful for non-motor symptoms. And it may be more beneficial for people to exercise in a group uh, rather than trying to do things on your own, more successful. OK, and so this is the work of here in Hong Kong, Margaret Max group. Um, again, they, they tested this outdoor exercise program. And they followed people for 12 months. And you can see how much better they 
this is again, this is a balance measure. And you can see how much better they did consistently for that whole period of time when they were doing this outdoor balance training. So one, one of the things that sometimes we forget about in our, um, in our exercise are things that are difficult for people with Parkinson's are turning. And so we like to work on turning in our exercise. So when you think about, turn, when you think about yourself coming here this morning or getting ready at your home, you, you very, uh, very rarely do you walk in a straight line. So you walk, you, you turn every two or three steps, two or three times per 10 steps is what, what people do. So this is, this is a video of a person at home with Parkinson's and she lives in a small apartment and she had a video camera on. And you can see she's walking into her kitchen. She's gonna make herself some tea. So you can see that this is a, how much you actually have to be able to turn. And turning is very, difficult for par people with Parkinson's, particularly if you have freezing of gait. And part of the reason is it's complicated to go from straight walking to turning. So we've incorporated some of these in our exercise program that we're, we're doing in, in Oregon. And this is actually, this is um, Andy Grove, who I showed you with the um, stick fighting. He's the one that sort of spearheaded the ideas behind a lot of this and brought people together to come up with some better ideas. And so when we think about exercise, we think about in incorporating all of these different, different things. So endurance, balance, coordination, speed, your reflexes, how quickly you respond when you get pushed off balance, your strength, and then your cognition and working on the dual task. All these together create agility, so your, the ability to change positions quickly and uh, without falling. So what we're doing, this is a study going on now, we're about halfway through it, is we're looking at, we have people come in three times a week and we do very specific um, things that people with Parkinson's have trouble with. So we wor work on big steps, increasing their step size. Um, we work in different directions, so to the side, back ways, backwards. Um, we do lunges and agility course. Boxing is becoming how people are interested in using boxing and Tai Chi. But what we're doing differently then is progressing that with different uh, cognitive tasks. So we have, we have them doing something at the same time. So he's looking at a board and we're asking him to do a task. Um, here we have him doing an, uh, a word task um, in different directions. And here we have him paying attention to a signal that um, he has to pay a lot of attention to while he's doing his task. And so the, the thing we work on is prioritizing. So you can do the same activity, and we can tell him to do two things at once, but focus on, on your balance. So focus on doing the sideways movement. Whereas here we say focus on the task to bring awareness of that switching back and forth. So here's, here's an example of the, one of the patients in the program. I okay, so remember those heel strikes and arm swings. Heel strikes and arms. You have to be able to step over, aren't you? Up and over, there you go. Now both feet on each dot. Head up, Carl. Use your arms. So she's working on some of the things that if you see a physical therapist, they may tell you, get your arm swings bigger, get your steps bigger. Um, but she's not asking him to do a dual task because it's, you can see it's already very difficult what she's having him do. So then when he comes back six weeks later, he does the same thing and she's having a, a complex conversation with him. Oregon, did you grow up in Oregon? I spent most of my life here. Okay. Then can you tell me any city in Oregon that starts with the letter A? Albany. Any other cities? That's started. Good. Can you think of any more? Start with the letter B. B. Any other? Okay, so you can see how much you improved in that um, over the course of, that was for six weeks. So another consideration is not only what you do for exercise, but how you do it. Do you do it, do you go to a group class? Do you go to a physical therapist? Or do you try to do it on your own at home? And so in the United States, uh, when someone comes to physical therapy, 
they don't have so many visits. They can only come a, a, a few times. So they go home and they do, do their exercises on their own, um, which probably is not the best way to, to do an exercise. So we, we actually looked at that. We compared someone at a group at home versus coming into physical therapy versus going to a group class, all doing the same exercise. And what we found was the people who did it at home they didn't improve, um, really, actually, in anything. It was, it was kind of sad, because that's what we are doing for our, um, our model. So they didn't improve. The group that saw one-on-one -on -one physical therapy improved the most, for sure. They improved the most in their balance, um, in their depression, and in their uh, activities of daily living assessment. The people that went to the class, actually, surprisingly, improved the most in the dual task because it's more dynamic. You're interacting with your friends, you're having to watch what other people are doing, and they improve the most in the freezing of gait and the walking um, tasks. And what we also found was if you have any of these comorbidities, which are very common with Parkinson's, so if you have depression, if you have um, some mild cognitive impairments, if you have other medical comorbidities, if you're on a lot of medications, and if you're very severe with your Parkinson's. That was the most, um, those were the reasons people didn't improve in the home exercise group. So if you're a patient with any of these, um, it's, it's very important to get yourself into a group class or to go see someone that can help you um, be successful with that. So there's every stage of Parkinson's. Um, you would be focusing on different aspects of, of your movements. So, Again, early on, so newly diagnosed, right when you're diagnosed, this is when you want to be really doing a lot of um, strength training and, and aerobic and trying to uh, approach exercise from that neuroprotection. So you're trying to um, increase the neurotrophic factors in your brain to help your brain. As the disease progresses, though, then you might need to do some of those compensations like I showed you the videos. So you might need to do other things to achieve um, safe movement. And, um, and later on, and sort of at all stages of Parkinson's, you need to be working on flexibility, postural alignment, because of the, you get very stooped um, over time, um, breathing, and working on movements, um, awareness of your movements, big, big movements, arm swings, and things like that. Um, so to be safe when you exercise, um, again, it's very important to go see your doctor. Um, make sure you're, it's okay for you to be exercising. Try to see a physical therapist who, who understands Parkinson's disease, and, or find a trainer. We, we work a lot with exercise trainers. Um, but it's important because Parkinson's, as you know, is very um, unique and specific. Um, the movement problems you have are very specific. So going to someone who understands the disease is important. And things to watch out for are trips, for falling, um, particularly when the lighting's low or if, it's, if, um, if you're outside. Lightheadedness, we heard um, before about changes with your, uh, often with blood pressure, particularly as the disease progresses. Um, and just injuries and effects of medication. It's best to exercise when you're most effectively on your medications. Um, it's safer, you learn faster. And so we try to tell people to time that with their medications. Um, and lastly, the question we still, when you think about what's the best exercise, um, we, there really isn't a best exercise. Um, one of the key things is hitting several different areas of mobility. So you want to do some of each. So it's good to try new things. Um, if there's something you like, stick with it. But when you think about what's better between aerobic or this complex um, exercise like I showed you, or strength training, it's important to do a little bit of everything because there's not one exercise that's the most beneficial. So we, this is a, a card that we give patients, and we just put this together as a way to remind people uh, what, what the ideal amount of exercise is. So this was based on what we recommend for older adults, and we adapted it for Parkinson's. So as you can see, there's you're, you're meant to do cardiovascular, so either walking or something that gets your heart rate up. You're meant to do that about five times a week, even just for 30 minutes each time. So if you, if you have this, then you can just do a check mark when you've done that throughout the week. Um, strength training, and particular muscles are important to um, strengthen so that you don't become so flexed like that. 
Um, and that you're meant to do two, two or three times a week. So that's something that's gonna make your muscles stronger. Flexibility, um, it's good to incorporate that every single day into your, your um, routine of the day, even just for 10 minutes. And then this is really important, um, the balance. So these are things like Tai Chi, dance, agility, um, tennis and some kind of racket sports people play. And this you're meant to do three times a week, even just for 20 minutes. Um, so this is kind of the best case scenario if you, if you have time and um, it's, I know it's a lot, so our patients have a hard time fitting, I mean even everyone has a hard time fitting this much exercise in. But really just trying to be aware of the different types of exercise you, you should be doing. And this just explains what each of these are. And again, these are just examples. So you might um, in, do different things in, in this culture that we don't do in Oregon, where I'm from. Um, but we have a lot of people that like hiking and um, bicycling and things like that. So um, we just kind of pick these as um, examples of what people are doing to stay healthy. And then finally, I'd like to conclude with um, just, a, this is the lab where I work, so this is our balance disorders lab. This is um, Oregon, where I come from, and the mountains behind. And we have a big lab with, um, we have engineers and physical therapists and neuroscientists, and so we're very, um, lots of different backgrounds in our lab. All interested, though, in uh, using exercise and movement to help Parkinson's disease. So. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any afterwards. Thank you. Hey, I'll come back now.